our first reading for today, Isaiah 25, verses 1 to 8. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name, for in perfect faithfulness you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. You have made this city a heap of rubble, the fortified town a ruin, the foreigner's stronghold a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will honour you. Cities of ruthless nations will revere you. You have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in their distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm, driving against the wall and like the heat of a desert. You silence the uproar of foreigners as heat is reduced by the shadow of a cloud. So the, strong, so the song of the ruthless is stilled. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, for the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the, sh the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace for, from, all the, from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. And now from, for our second reading, Luke chapter 14, verse 15 to 24. When one of those at the table was with him, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet, and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I have just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told the servant, Go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in, so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. This is the word of our Lord. Jemima, thank you very much uh, for reading that for us. And good morning, everyone. Um, if you've not met before, my name's Andy, I'm one of the elders here at Christchurch Ballam. And this uh, term, we've been going through Luke's Gospel. We've called this series, um, This is the Way, because Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And along the way, he is teaching us, his disciples, the way, uh, what it means to follow him. So if you're here and you're following Jesus, or even you're here and you're just looking in on, on Christian things, you've got big questions. This passage has a lot to say to us. So we need God's help. Um, if you could keep your Bible open uh, at uh, page 787, um, that would help you. And a little handout might give you an idea of where I'm going to go. But we need God's help. So I'm going to pray. Let's bow our heads. Father God, as Jesus uh, heads to the cross, help us, Lord, to understand why he's doing that. Help us, Lord, to appreciate again all that he is doing, uh, that we might be with you. I pray, Father, you would give each of us soft hearts, hearts that are willing to listen, hearts that are willing to obey. Uh, please, Father, would your spirit do mighty things amongst us today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you might notice as Jemima read, but our passage today centers around a massive, lavish party. And I don't know what's the most lavish, massive party you've ever been to. Uh, maybe it's a bit a wedding, which you were invited to over the summer. Uh, if you're a student, maybe you can think of one of those massive balls which you go to, and these enormous, lavish things. I've done a bit of Googling this week, inevitably, and I gather the most lavish, expensive party in the world is the Met Gala at New York. 
It's a, it's a fundraising a ball, I gather, to fundraise for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And celebs and movie stars, they're all showcasing the latest fashions. Uh, fashions like this. Um, they'll be, everyone will be wearing this next season. And, uh, and everyone there, if they go along to be, to see and to be seen, it's that sort of, that sort of party, isn't it? And you may, maybe seen photos like this of the red carpets, but no one actually really knows what happens on the inside of the party. Apparently there's a really strict no phones policy. And if, it, if you take photos and share them on social media, you're excluded from, from uh, future Met Galas. So no one really knows what's going on. But what we do know is that it's a lavish sit down meal. Uh, three, four courses, exquisite food, uh, follow, followed up by world-class entertainment uh, by, by the greatest of pop and rock stars, so I gather. So if, uh, if you're hoping to attend the 2024 uh, Met Gala held in May, uh, this is what it'll cost you. It'll cost you $50,000 for just one ticket. If you want to book a table for your friends and family, it'll cost you half a million. So then, Chances are we're not going to get an invite. According to Vogue magazine, the only way to get in, three ways, you can either be super rich and buy your way in, or super famous and sort of lend your status and your fame to the occasion, or super talented and perform uh, at the entertainment afterwards. Well, the question our passage asks today is who is it that God wants at his eternal life party? Who does God want at his feast, at his banquet? Because here's the thing, if you're here today and you're kind of newer to Christian things, you might be assuming God kind of operates on the same basis as the Met Gala. You might assume that God really only wants those with the, with the most spiritual cash in the bank. You might assume that God only really wants those whose, whose lives are arrayed in the most beautiful purity and splendor. You might assume that God only wants those who perform the best in the service of his kingdom. That's the way the world works. And so you might assume that's how God works. And so looking at yourself, you might wonder, well, might God want someone like me at a party like this? With the person I am and the things I've done. Would I fit in at that party? Am I wanted at his party? Well, if you were here last week, um, we saw that Jesus is currently at a dinner party. His host is a prominent Pharisee, uh, an ultra conservative uh, religious leader in his community. However, we've discovered that he's invited Jesus for dinner, not in order to honor him, but in order to trap him to expose him as a sabbath breaker and in response ironically jesus exposes all the pharisees there as self-righteous and most embarrassingly uh, jesus just before our passage begins uh, jesus shames the host in front of everybody now it's fair to say isn't it so far this dinner party has been an utter car crash okay it's been a complete disaster if you were there you could have could have cut the tension with a knife. Super awkward. And so it's probably why some well-meaning person in verse 15 tries to salvage this, this train wreck. He tries to find, you know that person, whenever there's a disagreement in your family, they always try and find some common area of agreement. Well, we can all agree about this, can't we? Well, that's what this person does. Look at verse 15. It's usually my mum in my family who does that. <laughs> verse 15. Jesus just insulted the host. Verse 15, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, oh, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. So this uh, well-meaning interjector, he, he's drawing our minds to, to our first reading in Isaiah 25. And now that, that party, that party, it, it, it kind of blows the Met Gala out of the water, doesn't it? You might remember from Isaiah 25 that poetic description of that party. Now, the prophet describes it as a feast being held atop a mountain, a place of beauty, a place of security. Now, it's unlikely to be the French Alps. 
but we're just, it's described as the heavenly Mount Zion, the new Jerusalem. That's the setting for this party. And we're told that, that all the invitees are told to expect the finest of wines. And I've done a bit of Googling again. I gather that's the Romani Conti, uh, which is about half a million a bottle. That's what everyone will be drinking at this banquet. Uh, invitees are also told to expect the richest of foods. The richest of foods. I don't know if that's the, the finesse of a Michelin star meal or the finest of meats, which is probably what I'd prefer. Um, the finest of meats. Uh, I like mine rare, right at the top, but everyone gets uh, whatever they want, uh, ordered bespoke. Isaiah's poetry, it kind of torpedoes that idea that God's a cosmic killjoy. No, God is the ultimate party thrower. Life in his kingdom is going to be brilliant. But really, the food and the drink, they pale into insignificance compared to the after-dinner entertainment where we're told the Lord God himself will swallow up death forever. And that shroud, you know shrouds which are placed over dead bodies, that shroud which hovers over the peoples, God says, I'm going to destroy it forever. And it gets even more intimate because we're told that our host will personally, intimately wipe away every tear from every face. That all shame will be done away with. Anything which causes disgrace will be removed forever. That's the image here. Verse 15, this person blurts out, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. And of course that's true. But this well-meaning interjector, they actually drop a bit of a clangor. Because the assumption in what they're saying here, the assumption is that they and all the other Pharisees present at this meal with Jesus, the assumption is that they're all going to be eating this meal. When Jesus says they're not. So Jesus tells this parable, this little story. And and initially he confirms that yes, indeed, many, many have been invited. Look at verse 16. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. Now, when it comes to sort of party organization, there's a massive difference between our culture now and their culture back then so our our sort of time conscious culture what we do is we we decide the time and the date and then we send out uh, invites to all our friends and they send back rsvps telling us whether or not they're going to come we're very specific aren't we was back then in a less time conscious culture the the invitation always come in two parts and that's what we see here first you would let your guests know that you're going to throw a big party we see that in verse 16 at which point they're going to tell you whether or not they want to come or not. And, and once the host knows how many people are, are said they're interested in going, he then goes home and gets ready. He would, he'll kill the right-sized animal. So if only one or two people want to come, he'll kill a pigeon or something. You know, if, if a huge amount of people will kill multiple fattened calves and you get you order in the right number of folding chairs, things like that, they, they, you know, they gets, the, gets the meal ready. And only once the meal is ready would the second part of the invitation come. Once everyone is ready, you'll send out a servant to tell each of those invited people to come, to drop whatever you're doing and come. That's how it worked back then. So it seems that the the many guests who were invited here in verse 16, it seems they've been waiting for a while. And now, at last, this banquet is ready. Come. Come. Everything's been paid for. Everything that has been promised is now here. Everything is about to be delivered exactly as was promised. So we can imagine that the host servant going from house to house saying, come, 
come, come, come. And, and, and it's interesting, isn't it? Back in Isaiah 25, the, the host of the feast is obviously the Lord God himself. But by the end of this parable, it's Jesus who reveals that he is in fact the host. This is his feast, his banquet. So essentially he's saying to the Pharisees here that he is the one that all Israel have been waiting for. That he is the fulfillment of the scriptures. That, that he is the one who will invite them to the heavenly Mount Zion. He is the one. And in fact, this is why, as you know, as we've heard in previous weeks, Jesus is currently walking to Jerusalem. Uh, he's going, he's walking there in order that on the cross, he would face disgrace so that our disgrace might be destroyed forever. That he would swallow up death for us by being eaten by death. His, his body laid under a shroud so the shroud might be removed from us. But of course, in the end, death couldn't beat him, could it? Um, he was laid in the tomb and he burst forth from the grave, proving that he is the life and soul of the party, that he is the ultimate party host. He is inviting us and he's sending it out saying, come, everything is ready. Come, everything has been prepared. There's nothing more that needs to be done. Come, he says. Jesus wants his Jewish countrymen to know that there's nothing more they need to wait for. Come, everything is ready. But the shock and scandal is that whilst many have been invited, many make excuses. And that's true even today. Look at verse 18. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, oh, I've, I've just bought a field and, and I must go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I've just got married and I, I can't come. Please excuse me. Now, at first sight, these excuses sound reasonable, don't they? Uh, clearly, there's something more pressing going on, perhaps something more urgent going on than this celebration. Their, their field, uh, their, their, their business, their family. These are all good things, aren't they? Really good things. But just a moment's thought reveals that these excuses are utterly pathetic. I mean, why do you need to go check out a field if you've already bought it? Surely you would have checked it out beforehand. And likewise with the oxen, surely you want to try out your five yokes of oxen before laying down money for them. And if you just got married, well, what newlywed wife wouldn't want to be taken to a feast and a ball to be danced with the night away? But the, the real scandal of these excuses lies in the fact that back in verse 17, each of these people had previously replied with a yes. So in our context, in our day to day, that would be like, imagine you've got a whole bunch of people around for a meal. OK, you invite a whole bunch of people around for a meal and you, you, you get them to wait in the living room um, because you're still busy sort of cooking and finishing up, laying up the table. And once you've finished cooking and laying up the table, you go through to, to the living room and say, OK, everyone, uh, dinner's now ready. Come on through to the dining room. And it's at that point that they go, oh, no, sorry, Andy, I, I, I I've got to go. And one by one, each of your guests walk out leaving you with an enormous feast and no one to eat it. That's, that's the sort of a parallel with what's going on here. Now, given how outrageously rude that is, we might well wonder if the guests are acting together in collusion. Uh, are, they, are they trying to deliberately boycott this great feast in order to bring shame upon the host? Are they trying to mark him out somehow as a social outcast? If so, it's a bit like Mean Girls. Have you ever seen that film, Mean Girls? Um, B. Bennett's favourite film. She was telling me about it this week. And um, 
This is a bit of a mean girl's move, isn't it? If you've seen it, you'll know Regina George uh, on the right there. She's the, the, the most popular girl at the high school, the Queen Bee. And uh, in a particular scene, we see her carefully rejecting invitations to parties, uh, carefully rejecting social occasions as a way of asserting her dominance, as a way of saying, I'm the one in control here. Uh, I'm the insider and they're outsiders. Well, throughout Luke's gospel, that's basically what the Pharisees have been doing, isn't it? Trying to assert that Jesus is the lawbreaker. He's the outcast and they're the true insiders. So I hope you see that their rejection of this invitation is not just rude. It's also an insult to the host who has gone to such great lengths, such painful lengths to include them in this feast. Uh, Jesus' point is clear, isn't it? God is preparing the greatest party imaginable. He has sent his own son to, to gather all those whom he has invited. And, and yet the leaders of Israel, the people who, who knew about this invitation for hundreds of years, it, it seems they've got better things to do, better places to go. Now, it's tempting, isn't it, to kind of treat the Pharisees as the pantomime villains and sort of boo and hiss every time they sort of walk on stage and we go, oh, no, no, we're not like the Pharisees. Should we just examine that a bit? I wonder if there's a little bit of that in our hearts. I wonder if we see anything of ourselves in, in their response to this invitation. The thing I've noticed that over the years, it, that the reasons people give for rejecting Jesus are often not because they want to cling on to some heinous vice or evil. No, I don't want Jesus. I want to carry on taking drugs and prostituting. You know, or I want to carry on worshipping my evil satanic gods. No one says that, do they? No, more often they reject the invite because they've just simply got other priorities. Their legacy, their field, means more to them. Their work just means more to them. Being a big name there means more to them. That the drive for romantic intimacy or the desire must have children, it just means more to them. And so it is that people don't exactly explicitly say no to Jesus so much as they say yes to everything else. And, and so these good things of life ironically end up coming to eclipse the author of life. If you're here today and you wouldn't yet call yourself a Christian, if you wouldn't yet call yourself a follower of Jesus, ask yourself, what can be of more importance than attending this feast? Do you really have a better reason to live than this? Do you really have an answer to death without this? But I think it's a challenge here for Christians too. Because often our, our priorities are kind of revealed in our, in our decision making, isn't it? And so one of the lovely things about London, one of the fun things about it, is just how busy it is. And all the things going on and, you know, uh, all the social events, all the sporting events, all the schools events and everything going on. It, it, living in London, is, it's where all the action is, isn't it? And particularly that, often that action happens at the weekends. And, and, and sometimes we find, don't we, we all find this, that sometimes we find that these good things end up clashing uh, with, with Sunday worship here. Now, inevitably, there's going to be times when, when in that exchange, church loses out. Um, you, you've got to attend Granny's 80th birthday party. You can't say, sorry, I must be at church for that. You know, that wouldn't fly. You know, there's, of course, there's going to be times when we miss church, when we're ill or on holiday, whatever. But I'd be concerned for the person for whom, whenever there's any clash, uh, with a social event, a sporting event, a schools event, whenever there's any clash, I'd be concerned for the person for when church is always the loser. When the church is always the person, that, when it's church family always misses out in that exchange. Because that kind of reveals what our priorities are, doesn't it? I mean, consider when else do we get to gather with the Lord's own people, his family like this? 
When else do we get to hear his word preached to us, to our hearts, from someone who knows us? When else do we get to gather around the Lord's table in anticipation of that great future feast and banquet? Friends, you might not realize this, but this church is the closest we're going to get this side of glory to this wedding feast, to this great banquet. This is as good as it gets. This is as close as it gets. So what could be of greater importance than this? The scary thing here is that none of the Pharisees would have thought they were rejecting the the banquet. All of them would have assumed that they were shoo-ins to the feast. But their priorities and their excuses kind of reveal where their hearts are really at. Many are invited. Many make excuses. So let's go back to the parable how is the host going to respond? Did, will he just, you know, turf the food out, <laughs> um, give it to the dogs? What, what's he going to do? Cancel the party? No. One way or another, he tells us his house is going to be full. Verse 21. Verse 21. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor the crippled the blind and the lame there's no way this host is just going to bin all of that food and let this party go to waste and and so if his wealthy and powerful friends will not attend well Then he'll invite the poor and the weak outcasts to join him instead. Those who have no spiritual capital to pay for this meal. Those who have no power or ability to even get themselves to this feast. The master says, I want them at my party. I want to eat and feast with the homeless, with people who have nothing to offer me. In fact, the other way around, people who might in fact bring shame upon me if I were to bring them in. And this parable explains so much about Jesus' ministry so far through Luke's gospel, doesn't it? At the very beginning, who first hears about Jesus' birth? Outcast shepherds. Who first hears the call to follow him? Galilean fishermen is prostitutes and lepers and tax collectors that Jesus eats with and feasts with and it's Israel's leaders and the Pharisees who will not come in and Jesus says, fine I'll eat with the outcast then but you know his love goes even further than that even further than the outcasts of Israel just look at what how it continues verse 22 Sir, the servant said, what you have ordered has already been done, but there's still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. Now, that's one thing, isn't it, for for Jesus to invite the outcasts and the broken people within Israel. It's quite another thing, another thing for him to publish his invite from those living outside of town, beyond the boundaries of his country. And we have here the fulfillment of that passage James took us to in Isaiah 56. Jesus wants the outsiders, the foreigners to come in. And we have here in anticipation the entirety of the book of Acts, where the gospel, the good news, is proclaimed to Gentile nations like us. Notice, I don't know if this struck you as strange. Notice verse 23, the master says, compel people in. What does that mean? It can't mean use force, can it? It doesn't mean like get a gun and say, you're coming to my party, all right? You know, it, it doesn't mean coerce people against their will, force them in. Like it completely goes against Jesus. But I think it means if these people are blind, 
or lame. They will f- need physically carrying to the party, leading to the party, compelling to the party. If, if these people are outcasts and ashamed, and I mean reinforcing that and persuading them that the host genuinely wants them to attend. Because everything in them will be screaming, no, you can't want me, you can't want me. Come, compel them in. When Prince Philip died a few years ago, um, people began sharing little anecdotes and stories about him. Some of them are not right for sharing. Um, this one is. Um, uh, one, of his, uh, one of my favourites is from Norman Tebbett. He's the, the, the old Conservative MP um, in the 80s. And he, you might know he and his wife Margaret were caught up in the IRA bomb attack in Brighton. And as a result of that attack, his wife Margaret was left partially paralysed uh, for, for the rest of her life. A few years later, they, they were both invited to a big state banquet at Buckingham Palace. And Margaret really did not want to go. Everything in her was scream, I don't want to go to this meal. Her condition meant she couldn't even hold cutlery right. And so whenever she'd eat with cutlery, she'd make a huge mess. And she didn't want to embarrass her husband, Norman, who's a bit of a big deal. So, so Norman tried to make excuses for Margaret. Hey, she can't come, she can't come. Buckingham Palace replied saying, no, she's going to come. No, we insist she comes. And so, you know, being felt compelled to come, they, they, they arrived at the banquet. And when Margaret was wheeled in and they looked at that board saying where you're supposed to sit, her heart sank because she was sitting next to Prince Philip. Oh. And so, as everyone was invited to, to sit at the meal, obviously she was still sitting. Um, and the first meal came out. And Prince Philip, Philip picked up his cut, cutlery and handed them to the footman behind him. And then he began to eat the first course with his hands, uh, clearly inviting Margaret to do the same. In fact, it wasn't just the first course, uh, the second course, the third course, the fourth course, all had been completely designed around the fact that for someone who couldn't eat with cutlery, the entire meal had been designed for her. And so everything about that meal screamed at her, I'm welcome, I'm wanted, the king, the prince wants me. And wants to eat with me at this meal. Consider the, consider the pains at which, by the way, all of that had been orchestrated and designed by Prince Philip. But, but just, just, just consider the, the lengths at which your king has gone to, to get you to this feast. You, you might object by saying, but I, 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 I can't pay. I have no spiritual cash in the bank. I can't. I don't deserve to be here. To which your king replies, come. Everything's been paid for. You might say, well, I, like Margaret, I'm, I'm a mess. I, I'm an embarrassment. You, you don't want me at this feast. To which the Lord Jesus says, come. I will clothe you myself. I'll remove your disgrace and your shame. You might be thinking, well, I don't belong. I don't belong here. To which the Lord Jesus says, no, you do belong because I've invited you by name. I want you to be there. As I close, can I urge each of us to stop making excuses? In verse 24, Jesus turns to those Pharisees sitting around the table with him and he addresses them directly. It's not part of the parable. He now turns to them. Verse 24, he says, I tell you, plural, not one of those who were invited initially will get a taste of my banquet. And so it is. This is the last time in Luke's gospel that we see Jesus sitting and eating with Pharisees. And his words here indicate that not one of them would eat at his feast in glory. But what about you? Some of us here have heard this invitation again and again and again. You've been hearing it for years, maybe, loudly and clearly. But for whatever reason, you've kept Jesus at arm's length, putting other things first. Your work first, your social life first, your romantic life first. Everything comes first. Jesus is inviting you, come and eat with me. There is no other way for life. There is no other answer for death. True life is found in me. 
come. Everything is now ready. In a moment's time, we're as a church family beginning gathering around this table. And it's a little foretaste, an hors d'oeuvre of that great feast, the heavenly banquet. And if you're here today and you're not yet trusting Jesus, but if today you want to say yes, I say yes to this invitation. Yes to Jesus, be my Lord and my Savior. Well, I'd like to invite you, even if this is your very first time, to come and eat with us as a sign that you want to eat with Jesus in that heavenly banquet, that you accept his death for you, that you accept being his follower. Stop making excuses. Today's the day. The rest of us, though, we don't just need to stop making excuses. We need to start compelling people into this party. I, I mean, just think about it. We have, we have the golden ticket in our hands, right? We, we, we've got a, you know, if you invite to the Met Gala, if you got given a ticket to the Met Gala, you'd be telling everyone, wouldn't you? I don't deserve to be here. I don't have 50,000 quid, but I've got an invite. Way! You'd be telling everyone. You've got a far greater invite than that. Tell people. It, and, and by the way, telling people that you've received this invitation is not a, a sign of superiority. I have an invite and you don't. It's not that at all. Christians, we are, we are merely beggars telling other beggars where to find food. So friends, this is really the essence of CCB. This is what we're about. We have the golden ticket and we want people to know that they are welcome too. Is this your heartbeat? Is this what you're about? Just think who you can invite to church next week to, to witness Naveen's baptism. Uh, think about who you can invite to your CU if you just uh, started in Freshers' Week. Consider who, what you could share with people tomorrow when they ask you what you did at the weekend. We have beggars merely telling other beggars where to find food. So yeah, we can show people our vulnerability. We can show people our brokenness and our sin and say, but here in Jesus, I have forgiveness. Here in Jesus, I have life. We can say to people, come. Everything is now ready. Shall I pray? And you might like to make my prayer your prayer. I'll pray it slowly. Maybe you want to echo it in your own heart. Heavenly Father, thank you for inviting me to this eternal banquet. I know I don't deserve it because of my sin and my messed up priorities. Please forgive me. Thank you for sending Jesus to do everything necessary so that I can feast with you. Help me now to rejoice in this invitation and share it with others. Amen.